There's a certain term that's getting a lot of recognition in the industry nowadays, and it's called these 12-factor applications. Um, I put it on the slide here as 12-factor services because I'm trying to think more in terms of services. And uh, you can learn more about these at this website that I mentioned here, 12factor.net. So what all I'm going to do is just briefly introduce the concepts that they have, and then we'll talk about a summary of what I like about them. So first I'll slide here, I'll go through the first five factors of a 12-factor service. Factor number one is that you implement your service with a single rooted repo, right, source code repo, and you don't share code with another service. The second factor is that you deploy your dependent libraries with the service. In other words, the service is completely self-contained and it has all its dependencies with it and it travels as a single unit. This is going to improve your ability to test it on your developer machine, your test cloud, your staging cloud, your production cloud, and so on. The third factor is not to put configuration in source code. Instead, you should read the configuration from external source, and typically that's done with environment variables. Environment variables are supported by every operating system, Windows and Linux, and it's a very easy thing to use. It's very consistent. <clears throat> um, also, it's easy to change environment variables in dev versus test versus you know, staging versus production clouds. So factor number four is handle unresponsive service dependencies robustly. This is, of course, when you're talking to another service that may be down, you want to be able to handle things in a robust way. Now, I did talk about this in the previous section, where in this, you know, architecting for distributed cloud apps, where we're focusing on embracing failure, that there really is no uh, failure. Um, but it's possible that something could be unresponsive, like the service is there, but it's not replying. And so this is more about focusing on that kind of resiliency, right, being robust against it. Factor number five is strictly separate your build, release, and run steps for your service. More specifically, when we talk about building, you're building a version of the code repo and you gather all the pen dependencies together, right? So you're building an artifact. And then release is you're gonna combine that build with configuration uh, and then that produces what's referred to as a release ID. And that can be a timestamp or it could be a GUID, but it's supposed to be an immutable thing. In other words, you should always be able to go backwards in time and build a version set of your source code with the dependencies together, combine it with a set of configuration, and make this immutable thing, right? You always reproduce the same thing. This gives you the ability for someone to say, well, when I, on this date, I was hitting this version of the service and I ran into this bug. And you might want to be able to really track that down, so you need to go and rebuild the exact same set of dependencies and code with the same exact set of configuration in order to debug that. Uh, and then run, of course, is running the service in an execution environment. And again, this could be a developer environment, a test environment, a staging, a production environment, and so on. We'll talk about these environments more when we talk about containers um, in the next section. And we'll also be talking about continuous integration and uh, continuous deployment and continuous delivery there too. And we'll also focus on execution environments there. Continuing with the 12-factor services, we'll now on this slide talk about factors 6 through 12. Factor 6 is your service is one or more stateless processes and shares nothing, right? So again, we're trying to isolate things down and try to keep things simple with this. Stateless is, means that, you know, you know, if the process dies, it's not managing any state, so it can come back up easily. And then we're going to talk uh, much later in this course about uh, storage services, where it's a place you can store state and all of the things that are related to storage services. We'll get to that later. It's a very complex subject with a lot of nuances to it. So a generally good programming model is you separate your stateful services or your storage services from your stateless services. And the 12-factor app is really talking about how to design these stateless services. We'll talk about stateful or stored services later off in, in the course. 
Factor number seven is your service listens on ports uh, and avoids using web hosts. In other words, again, we want to keep things simple. So sometimes when you're using web hosting agents, they have complex configuration. They have different versions of them that do different things or maybe have different bugs in them or different performance characteristics in them. So it's a recommendation of the 12 factor methodology that you avoid web hosts and you just have your simple service go and open up a port, listen on it, and just try to keep things simple and re reducing the number of dependencies that your application requires in order to run. Factor number eight, use processes for isolation um, and use multiple of processes in order to do concurrency. So here they're recommending that you not try to avoid using multiple threads within a single process. The idea here, of course, is that multi-threaded programming is quite complicated and hard. I've done it for many decades of my life. I've written a lot of books and magazine articles on concurrency-related issues and thread synchronization, and this stuff is hard. I've been doing it for decades, and I still occasionally make mistakes with it, too. So the recommendation here is that you try to keep your processes single-threaded and that if you need to do things concurrently, spawn off multiple processes. So each has their own address space, they're, so they're isolated from one another to reduce the potential that concurrency synchronization issues can cause deadlocks and you know, other corrupted memory state within your single process. Um, that not step number eight, I don't always adhere to myself. Um, again, I'm very used to making multi-threaded applications and using multiple threads for concurrency in .NET apps or C, C++ apps or Java apps. And so um, I don't always adhere to that, but that is one of the things that they recommend. Step number nine, or factor nine, is that processes can crash or be killed quickly and start fast. Well, we've already been talking about this quite a bit, where your application can crash due to an unhandled exception, or maybe the orchestrator is scaling your instances down so it kills one of your instances, and then it's going to restart one, your instance over again. So you want to design your services to be able to kill quickly, and you want to be able to start fast so they come back online. Try to avoid having long initialization pr processes that happen when your service starts up. That's what process nine is about, so that you're, again, you know, can respond to failure in a more brisk fashion. Factor number 10 is keep your development, staging, and production environment similar. Obviously, you know, if your development environment is you know, one set of operating systems and dependencies and your production environment is something else, if you've done all your testing in the development environment but then you run with a different operating system or version in production, then you may not have caught everything. So just trying to keep things simpler, similar between these environments makes it more likely that what you've tested is what you'll actually be deploying against so you've, your testing mattered. Right, it was is, is meaningful in some way. Factor number 11 is log to standard output. So in a development environment, this means that your application or service would be logging to the console window. Uh, in a production, you would probably redirect standard output to a file, so it gets logged to a file, and then you're gonna archive these log files. Really what they're trying to say here is keep the logging simple. Right, don't come up with very complex logging scenarios. Just keep it very simple so that you know the logs work, so that the logging happens very quickly, and that it gives you flexibility in you know, development. I can log just by simply look at the console. In production, I can go and redirect that standard output to a file, and then archive those files later on. Right, so the logging is also similar between development and production as well. And then factor number 12, which is the last factor, deploy and run administrative tasks uh, as scripts, as processes. In other words, make these predictable, right? So the, you, any administrative task you need to do, like maybe on a Windows machine, you need to go and some, set up some registry settings, or maybe you need to go and you know, pre-initialize some environment variables to have certain values. Right? Don't log into a machine or remote desktop into a machine and go and change those things manually. Automate all of this stuff and make it run in a predictable fashion. And then also test this in your development environment, your staging environment, your production environment, so that it runs in a consistent way all the time and it's easily reproducible. So if you really analyze those 12 factors and you kind of think, you know, what 
what's really the Zen, you know, or what's the, really the main concepts to take away from them, then you'll realize that really what they're all trying to say is that your services should be simple. They should be simple to code, simple to build, simple to test, simple to deploy, simple to log, um, you know, simple to start up, simple to shut down, right? Keep things simple. Don't over-architect solutions. Make it simple. Services should be lightweight, right? They should have as few a number of dependencies as possible. Uh, so, you know, try to keep the operating system that you need small. Don't take, more on, more, don't take on more of an operating system than you actually need in order to run, right? You want to use as little memory as possible. You want to have as few other background services running in the operating system as possible. All those things might have an effect somewhere and that they can introduce some degree of unpredictability. Right? Have a few, as few dependencies as possible on your programming language, on your runtime libraries, uh, or, your, or your runtime, and on your libraries. Um, run your application. You want your application to run fast, and you want to use as little RAM as possible um, so that you can run more of these on, you can use smaller virtual machines, which ends up saving you money. And maybe you can run fewer virtual machines, which ends up saving you money. Um, services should give reproducible results on the developer PC as well as on test, staging, and production clouds. And again, this is all about making sure that what you've tested is actually meaningful when you go and move that application somewhere else so, and that it's not wasted effort. And that it also means you're more likely to catch the bugs at, during testing time as opposed to deployment time. So those are the 12-factor applications. I'd encourage you to read more about it, but it is pretty simple when all is said and done, and I think there's a lot of good philosophies to stick by as you are architecting your services to run in a distributed cloud environment.